Good morning and welcome to the Christian Indie Writers Podcast, where we inform, encourage, and support Christian indie writers on their journey to publication. I'm Jamie Hirschberger. I write short fiction under the pen name J.R. Nichols. Hi, I'm Jennifer Carl Tong, and I write historical Christian romance. Hi, I'm Christina Katane, and I write in multiple genres, including Christian dystopian fiction. And uh, the lovely Rhonda Hagerman can't be with us today because poor baby is on a wonderful vacation. So um, we miss you, Rhonda, and the podcast won't be the same without you, but we hope you're having a great time. Um, if you like what we do on the Christian Indie Writers podcast, we'd love for you to like and subscribe below. So we always start our episodes with a segment we call What's Up? It's where we check in with one another, find out how we're doing in our personal lives, because this is sort of like our writing group and we miss each other and want to know what's going on. So what's going on with you, Jen? Well, first of all, I want to apologize that we were five minutes late for the podcast. That was my fault. Um, I forgot to do something really quick, but things are going well with me. Um, my husband flies in today. For, I know I don't... I don't I know uh, quite a few podcasts ago, I made a comment that later on, you all said to me, that sounded terrible. I had said that when, when my husband laughed, blah, 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 blah. And what I meant was like when he left to go work out of state and everyone's like, that didn't sound good. So <laughs> I, I don't really advertise that he's working on a state because there's just so many weirdos in the world. Nobody needs to know that like my husband's not around all the time, but you know, um, we're members of the NRA, so I'm, I'm safe. But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, um, oh yeah, um, yeah, and you have two ferocious attack dogs, also. I like sometimes do. you hear barking in the background. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. <laughs> um, they're ferocious. Anyway, he flies in today, um, in just a couple hours, and so I'm picking my girls up early from school, which they're super excited about. So this is gonna be a good weekend. We are planning to. Our plan was to go to Detroit this weekend, spend some time, just kind of walk around doing just fun stuff, Eastern market, whatever, and then tapping the day off with a Tigers game. But if you guys looked at the weather at all here in Michigan, it's not going to be very nice. So my daughters are not, they like the Tigers, but they're not diehard fans. And they're also kind of princesses. So I don't foresee mm -hmm. them sitting through the rain to watch them. So we will see what happens, but that was our plan for, the, we'll see. I'll update you next week to see how it went. But yeah, how about I mean, you? even jumping in puddles can be fun when it's a reunion, right? Yeah. I mean, it would be fun, but to do it all day long, I don't know that they would be <laughs> up for that, so, right. which was my plan, right? I really want to get some pizza. There's this great pizza place down by Eastern Market. I can never remember what it's called. Maybe you know, Jamie. It's um the closest to New York style pizza that you'll get oh. in Michigan. New York style, I don't know. I always think uh, about Pizza Populous, which is the Chicago deep dish. Oh, man. <gasps> I need that address oh, because that's okay. my favorite. My oh, favorite my is, my favorite is deep, the Chicago style deep dish. My second favorite is New York style, like East Coast style, the thin crust. It's so big you have to pull it over to that's eat so it. That's so funny. Mm. I have two separate kinds of pizza that are more different. And it's I know. The grease. Like you have to put yeah. it in a funnel and drain the grease. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Real cheese. A hundred percent. That's yes. Cool. And so like neither are keto at all, but I will this weekend we'll be eating pizza because I can. Um, and <laughs> um, my least favorite pizza is Detroit style, which is funny because it's kind of in between the two, but um, I don't like Detroit. I mean, I will eat it because I mean, it's, it's pizza. So there's no bad pizza. Right. So anyway, so that's a, why are my plans always about food? Like why, <laughs> everything I ever schedule, like, it's always about food. So I don't. Well, you gotta, I, I gotta eat. You know, what What are you doing? Or what are you up to lately, Tina? Um. Well, before I get into that, I just want to say I like Alaskan style pizza. So what does it have? It? Herring on it or something? Re reindeer or salmon? sausage. Reindeer sausage. Yeah, you can call Pizza Hut in Anchorage and order reindeer sausage on your pizza. Do they call it like the Rudolph or something? Yeah, I'm like a little. <laughs> no, no. Okay, so um, I was going to start with I may be crazy, but I think that's already been established. Yep. <laughs> um, so um, we are thinking about getting Charlie a wife. <gasps> you are really? crazy. Yeah. Because... Um, in all our research, we found, oh, he heard his name, and here he comes. Um, <laughs> we heard that rabbits do much better health-wise, both emotionally and physically, if they're part of a bonded pair. Oh. Um, so he is neutered, 
I don't have any um visions of bunnies, little baby bunnies hopping around because he's neutered and uh, the female we may get for him will also will be spayed. Would you get like a rescue bunny? Yes. Mm -hmm. We've already contacted a rescue. It's in Plymouth. That's the closest one. So it's a little bit of a trip. Um, but we filled out all the in the paperwork they require. They're very picky about who they give their bunnies to. Um, so that makes me happy, actually. Does it make um, you happy? It does. It makes me happy. <laughs> and and I, I feel like this is a great day to bring this up because so many people think it's a great idea to give bunnies as a gift on Easter. And then and they end up at the rescue a, or worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, you know, they think, oh, there's a war in a bunny. Like, there is a war in a bunnies across the street from my house. But those are not the same kind of bunnies as a pet bunny. And a pet bunny cannot survive in the wild. So when you go and you just let your bunny loose, it's, it's you know, a hawk is going to get it. Or those other bunnies are going to beat it up because, um, you know. It's in their territory. Bunnies are very territorial. So it's most rabbits that are given on Easter's gifts are dead within a year. Uh -huh. Yeah. So only give chocolate bunnies at Easter, chocolate right? And stuffed bunnies. Mm -hmm. so well, I think that I wonder um, how Charlie's behavior will improve or whatever with a, well, a little buddy. He'll be less neurotic from yeah. my research. Um, and he won't be, he won't be lonely and uh, they get depressed really easy. And, you know, if you want to be able to leave your bunny alone for any amount of time, they really need a companion because they are extremely social. So what we're going to do is we're going to go on speed dates. <laughs> oh my word. <laughs> you take him to the shelter, to the rescue, the bunny rescue. And he gets put in a pen and they, they'll only do three. See, they said after three bunnies, they'll all look the same to him. So only three at a time and they'll see how they like each other. And if they don't, you know, they could break out in a fight. So there's one <laughs> Perdita. I got my eye on her. I like her. <laughs> <laughs> matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. Great. Now that song stuck in my head. First, the song that stuck in my head was Where in the World is Rhonda Hagerman? And, that, and then I'm a little teapot. I got stuck in my head and now I have that song. You could make a musical. I could. You have three numbers now. Yeah. Well, so just anyway, real quick. Excitement in our yeah. Life. I'm just going to really quickly touch on my. Um, it's kind of strange to be in Florida for the first time during hurricane season, like which is just starting. And it's uh, I follow some like weather people. Mike's weather page has been a really good one for people who live in Florida. Of course, I don't worry so much about the hurricanes because I'm inland, you know. But the um, last year there was an evacuation for um, the villages because if you're in a mobile home, it's a mandatory evacuation. And so um, anyway, it can affect us over here. So, but it's just really weird to learn things like spaghetti models. Never heard of anything like that when I lived in Michigan. And um, all of the people on the weather page has given us tips like, you know, if you know there's a storm coming, fill your bathtub with water and your washing machine and all that kind of thing. So the what's up for me is just, uh, let's see what my first hurricane season has to, has in store for me. Because in Michigan, you know, you all get pretty good weather. I mean, you get tornadoes, but you don't have to worry about hurricanes or, I mean, you get some earthquakes, but nothing earth shattering. Huh? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so that's all that's going on with me. Um, so it's time to transition into our topic du jour, which today is finding your voice. And um, it's basically going to be a discussion about point of view. But, oh, I'm sorry, giving voice to your story is what we're officially calling this. Um, but before we talk about point of view, um, can we talk a little bit about the voice of a piece? You, uh, yes, we can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or the other way around, however you. Well, well, you were talking before the podcast, Jamie, that like you felt like we specifically need to talk about that the voice and point of view are not the same thing. And you were saying like what your opinion on that is. Yeah, because when I get a piece and I, I like the way the the author turned a phrase, I find that the piece overall, the narrator has like a humorous approach to the piece. I will tell the writer, I love the voice of this story. 
I'm not talking about the fact that they are doing a third person point of view or a first person point of view. I'm talking about the overall flavor of the piece, which is what I call the voice of the author or the voice of the story. Is that your latest experience? Yeah, I would say the same thing. I, I would say like when I think of voice, I think of like when you read a, a book and the characters are speaking, like you actually hear voices like you know sometimes you see like a little movie playing and so for me that that really is kind of what the voice is is that yes i this the narrator is a first person female but like the voice is really like you said like the flavor of what it is so. the flavor yeah the flavor yeah i was gonna say what jen said it's the voice you hear in your head when you're reading it i mean if you just really want to melt it down into layman's terms i guess so how do you think point of view though affects the voice of a piece? Like well, do you I think a great example would be um like the Hunger Games. Mhm. Mm so the Hunger Games was in first person from K a Katniss um mm -hmm. Katniss's point of view. And so the voice is Katniss's voice. And so who she is comes out in that because it's in first person mm -hmm. and you all it's almost and i was going to say this later when we talk about the difference between whether for what third first and third person how it affects the reader but when it's in first person like that and you're hearing her voice in your head um it's like you are katniss eberdeen right awesome. i think you can really yeah i think you can really um the point of view can really affect like how we feel the person's personality and how um how much um, voice they have because we're literally inside their head. And we all know that inside our head, if anyone, if everybody could hear what's going on inside of our head, they would really know who we were. Like there'd be, there's no fronts put on when you write first person. First person is like, this is like the, this is the raw inside what they're thinking and who they really are. So that's awesome. Them. So Jennifer, let's assume that we're starting with people who have no clue what first person might mean. So uh, do you want to kind of say what are the hallmarks or what does it mean to write first person? I'm probably not the best person to do this. I will, um, but because I never write first person. Um, I've read recently a lot of first person though. So um, first person is basically when you have Generally, you have one point of view for first person, not always, but generally you have one point of view for the whole story and you are only getting that person's view and you're inside their head. So you will see lots of I. I really thought he was looking at me and I hate it when they serve pizza and things like that. So um, that would be first person is when you, the pronoun I is used for the narrator. Yeah, uh, another way you could say that is the main character, the protagonist is the narrator. Mm. Tina, That's a much more intelligent way of saying it. Thank you, Tina. Well, you mentioned the Hunger Games. Um, do you know any other examples of first person in case um, people aren't familiar? that come to mind are the Hunger Games and Divergent. Yeah, and they're both the same um, genre. Yeah. Genre. And then um, in I my think... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. In my genre, I, the first person that comes to mind is Soraya Wilson. She writes a YA a clean romance. I don't think it's all YA, but um, you'll find that a lot of YA is first person. Like I think there's very little that is. Though so we did get some responses on our tw uh, our Twitter page this week from people that write YA that don't write in first person. But um, Soraya Wilson, if you're looking for something clean, uh, like a clean romance, she's really great. I can't, I cannot uh, give her enough praise. And I like her first name. You don't hear that first name very often. I know. Very pretty. Love it. Um, so, Tina, um, I kind of want you to discuss second person. I, now, to me, this is like the most fun of all of the points of view. Uh, what is second person, Tina? So second person is um, the narrator is talking to you and telling you, go do this or don't go do that. So there's so, a lot of you should do this and you went here, or you go here. And it's very rarely used in novels. I've had to read some short stories in some of the courses I took on writing that were written in second person. Um, it's mostly in commercials. If you pay attention to commercials, they're always second person. You go buy our products and you will be happy. And whether they say those words or not, that's like the underlying 
narration of every commercial you'll ever watch. So, um, right. And, so, um, technical manuals. Okay. So if you just got your new VCR, oh, I just, I just dated myself. <laughs> uh, DVD player. If you just got your new DVD player and you're trying to set it up, the instructions will be in second person. Um, and the U will be implied. It won't say you go plug it in. It'll say plug it in. So that's second person. And then a lot of songs. There's um, a lot of songs out there that are second person. Well, I like Radio Classics on Sirius XM, and they have at least one series that they play that is second person, and it's like, you thought you could get away with the murder because you threw the knife into the river or something like that. Um, and so essentially, you, uh, the reader, is the character in the story. Um, the Choose Your Own Adventure books of my youth, which now I'm dating myself, mm -hmm. uh, were you. You have to choose this or this to do throughout the course of the story. Um, it's very not widely used, as Tina said, and because I think people tire of it um, in a longer piece. So um, I think that's why it's not so widely used as far as novels. I remember the Choose Your Own Adventure. That was a big part of my um, elementary days, too. Those were like, those were great. Everyone was reading those. But the coolest thing is, my daughter said to me the other day, she said, Mom, have you seen this show on Netflix? And um, it is basically choose your own adventure, but it's a TV show. I guess they have a few different ones on there. And I should have asked her what the name of it was, but it's like a, a nature show and like a mystery kind of a thing. And then there's a, a guy that's out there and he's like, should we do this or should we do that? And then you have to select and it takes you to like different. So that would be another way you could do um, second person is we, like as if the narrator um. is having a conversation with the reader that would still be considered second person, I believe, because um, they are telling you what to do most of the time. But yeah, interesting. Like it's not something that interests me to do. But I think like Jamie said, I think I would get sick of it quickly, but it's, it's still interesting. I mean, yeah, maybe it's fun it? for something short or even just for character exploration possibly. Yeah. So what about uh, Jen? I think your preferred voice is third person limited, right? Yeah. What is, what does that mean? Third person limited is means that the narrator can get inside the head of um, of different people, but the only people that it can be inside the the narrator is inside the head of is the person that you're that you're in that scene with that perspective. So, for example, um, it's usually in romance um, is this way. If this chapter I'm writing is from Anna's perspective, I can't see what's inside Warren's head at that time. But the next chapter, if it's from Warren's perspective, I can see inside of Warren's head at that time. So that's why it's limited. It's not omniscient to where we can see inside everybody's head all the time. It's it's scene specific of whose head I am inside at that point. And that's why it's called third person limited. Limited, right. So you have interior knowledge of a character's feelings and thoughts and reactions, but only to the primary character of that particular chapter. Exactly. It's limited to that one character. And if you're ever in writing group and you're accused of head hopping, this is probably what they're thinking, what they're trying to tell you is that the whole scene is from the perspective of, say, Suzy Q. So Suzy Q picked up the glass. Suzy Q threw the glass against the wall. Suzy Q swept up the pieces. And then John's, John got angry. Well, you can't say John got angry because you don't know John's feelings and emotions. You have to stay inside Suzy Q's head. Is that about right? Yeah. And I think sometimes that that's even kind of more delicious, like to, to have to write it that way. Like, for example, when I first was writing Phoebe's story, which has now become book three of my series, um, I was only going to write uh, third person, very limited third person, just inside Phoebe's head. And the whole story is going to be told from her perspective. And we had to figure out what Will thought and what Will felt just by his actions and the way she interpreted them. And I really, really actually love the story better that way. But because it's part of a series, I had to make it fit the series better. And so that's kind of been part of my heartache with this, like headache with this story is trying to get more of Will's perspective in there. So, yeah. Okay. And some examples are pretty much Agatha Christie's Perot novels and most, um, most novels in general, I would say, are third person limited unless they're first person. Um, one point of view that we don't see as often, but I'm starting to see a lot more of, is called third person omniscient. And this is where the narrator knows all, sees all, tells all. So in one chapter, it could be 
where I said that you can't say John got angry, you absolutely can. You could say John got angry. Betty was feeling like crying her eyeballs out. And this is terrible writing, of course. This is off the top of, top of my head. Um, but third person omniscient has fallen out of favor. It used to be the only way to tell a story, as I recall, um, because people um, were more tale tellers and things were more um, oral traditions passed down. Um, is that something that you all remember hearing? Tina, you're nodding your head. Yeah, and a matter of fact, I, a lot of times the narration that's going on in my head when I'm thinking of a story is third person omniscient. And then I struggle to get it into limited when I'm actually writing. And it's interesting because, um, you know, Jennifer was saying how delicious it is to have to try to like, uh, I think I think third person limited forces you to show because you cannot tell. And sometimes I think when I read a third person omniscient, I feel like the person got away with something and they uh -huh. got to cheat because how convenient would it be for you to just be able to say, you know, Warren got angry or <clears throat> Warren that really took the wind out of his sails or something. You can't say that sort of thing when you're writing third person limited. The mm -hmm. trick of writing third person omniscient though, from what I understand is you have to start right out the gate doing an omniscient point of view. So you need to telegraph to your readers right away that this is the sort of story that they're going to get because otherwise they're going to be expecting third person limited. And when you suddenly start throwing in other people's thoughts and feelings, it's going to feel jolting to them and you're going to be called out for head hopping. Right. Yeah. And right. I think that if you're, even if you're writing third person omniscient, you still have to show rather than tell. I mean, yeah, rather tricky. than saying Warren got angry, you would have to say Warren felt the blood rising into his face and his being clenched his fists and show that he was angry instead of just saying Warren got angry. I, I think, think that's part of the good writing. Yeah, I think that's part of the problem, though, that I think that we have found when we've looked at third person omniscient is that that's not happening. It's because there's so many characters, especially if there's a scene with more than two people and they are telling you everything that's going on with like emotionally and everything with each person like they it, it tends to end up just sound to at least to me like uh, Warren was angry, but Anna didn't care. How do we know that? You know, just because you told us, you haven't shown us anything. So I think that's part of my issue. I don't really enjoy reading third person omniscient, and I don't think I would even enjoy writing it. But maybe I just haven't read good third person omniscient. Yeah. Um, I believe the Lemony Snicket series of unfortunate events is third person omniscient. Um, the, the, formatting of the series is very much like a once upon a time kind of a narration. Mm -hmm. um, and I did enjoy those. And in fact, I am having a hard time remembering if they are third person omniscient, because I'm not sure that the author spoke much about how the characters felt. He just more or less talked about the action of the piece. So mm -hmm. I would have to go and look at that. So correct me if I'm wrong. Anyone who knows the series, what team I read it a so long, long time ago with my kids. And I believe that there's like an outside narrator. So you actually know that there is a narr. You know how yes. um, we try to write a story so that the narrator disappears when we're writing a story. But the narrator is actually part of the story in Lemony Snicket. Like mm -hmm. the narrator is telling you a story and it's very obvious. Mm -hmm. And then trying to disappear. I would recommend, um, Jen, if you want to try to give a third person omniscient a try that you may like, Louise Penny writes a series about Inspector Gamache. Now, it's a police procedural uh, mystery story, so maybe not something that would like thrill you to think about since I know you, you like your romances, but it's well done in my opinion. Now, I did listen to the audiobook, to be fair, so I did have the benefit of a narrator switching voices and stuff, but I really um, thought that the third person omniscient was done well in in that series I, I i understand i only read the first book but i understand it carries all the way through <clears throat> and i i've been seeing it more you know when we did ask our twitter followers we did have some people say that they experiment with third person omniscient or that they even have chapters that are third person omniscient and some that are limited and i i feel like it's kind of something that's coming back have you guys found third person omniscient being more prevalent not in what I write and what I read, so I'm probably not a good person to comment on it. Mine, I'm I'm very much like super focused on on romance. That's what I enjoy. It's what I write. So you don't see it a lot in that. But what about you, Tina? 
I really don't pay attention enough, I think. I'm just interested in the story. Tell me a good story, and I don't care what the point of view is. Well, that's really awesome. And I think that that's a really good way to segue into how do you pick? So you're saying, tell me a good story, and I won't care what the point of view is. But still, when you sit down and you see that flashing cursor, you've got to start somewhere. Do you start with, I walked down the hallway and got a drink? Or do you start with, Susie was thirsty, so she got up to go get a drink, right? So how do you choose? I was just looking over some of our Twitter comments. Uh, Robin, Robin Sardi said, um, I write mostly third limited. That's what I do. But it depends on the story. Occasionally, first works better for the story. And I have some chapters that are omniscient. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So she writes, she's saying that she writes third limited, but that she has it within that some chapters that are omniscient. Interesting. So she's someone who goes into it knowing this is what I write. I write third limited. Mm hmm. Uh, Beth Wrangler said, or Wangler, sorry, Beth. Uh, it really depends on the story. My fantasy novels are first person. My fantasy short stories are third person limited, kind of deep point of view. And my fairy tale is third person limited. So would you guys agree that genre might affect it? Definitely. I think so. I mean, it's kind of like you guys were talking earlier in the podcast that young adult tends to be heavily first person, right? Because I think the expectation is that a young adult wants to feel like they're right there in the action. Mm -hmm. Michelle Rayburn here um, uh, also says, she says, I write nonfiction and I always write and it's always first person. Yeah. That would make sense. That nonfiction Mm -hmm. would be first person. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I I think that, sorry, go ahead. For me, it's the story. The story dictates how it should be told. Um, And so if the if the story and I'm not talking about the plot, I'm talking about the underlying story. It's going to be very emotional and very inside a person's head. Then I think that first person would work better. But if there's going to be more action um, and adventure kind of thing, then I think third person works better. I think for what I write, third person definitely works better. Third person limited. But like uh, another one of our Twitter followers um, pointed out, J.P. Robinson said that he writes like me, the third person limited generally because he writes political ther- the thrillers. Excuse me. Um, he said, but one point of view per scene slash chapter. And I have to agree with that. Um, unless you're doing omniscient, you if you're doing limited, you have to keep your scenes at least, if not the whole chapter, to one person. Otherwise, you're going to really confuse your readers. Yeah. And let's uh, dwell here for a moment because um, I've been to writing groups and we've even talked about a little bit in our postcast, um, which is where we have our um, critique of pieces that we submit. If you're not our Patreon subscriber, you should be if you would like to see how we do writing group critiques. Um, anyway, so people will submit a piece for a critique or something, and it'll say something like, oh, goodness, I can't think of a good example. But then the person will be called out for head hopping or switching points of view. And then my argument is like, well, isn't it obvious? So like, okay, so the point of view will be Mary. Mary, Mary, you know, is packing her bag and leaving her husband, and her husband puts his hands to his head and she can't say um, because he has a headache or like she can't say out of frustration, out of frustration, even though in my opinion, it's very obvious from the point of view of the character that she would know that he is frustrated. And yet um, that still violates third person limited. You still have to say as though he were frustrated because you really cannot say that, you know, John is frustrated with Mary. So this is one of the areas that I had to re- to work out with my first novel with Anna. There were quite a few of those things in there that I did not feel were head hopping. But when the editor started working on it with me, real, you know, he felt strongly that they were head hopping. And so that's probably the one thing we battled the most with was um, whether it was head hopping or not. And I changed most of it, like, because it wasn't hard. Like what you just said there, all you had to say was clearly frustrated. Like, so when you say something like that, it's it becomes more of an opinion by the person who's narrated. They're like, well, clearly he's frustrated or say something like appearing frustrated. He blah, blah, blah. I didn't like the appearing frustrated. That drove me nuts. <laughs> but there were times that I put my foot down and said, no, I'm keeping that. I don't care that it, it appears head hopping. If I were in this situation and I were this person, I would look at that and say, they're angry at me. 
and I'm going to, and I would leave it. So I, sometimes it comes down to personal choice. And if it's going to be something that I think a reader trips is going to trip on or be like, mm, then I'll change it. But if not, then I'm good. I sometimes will keep it. You could also use dialogue too. You could have one character say to the other, I can see that you're frustrated. <laughs> you know, there's yeah. all kinds of ways around it. It's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so it's just something that I think, especially a new writer, needs to be aware of because I think that switching point of view is a big um, first first time out the gate sort of a blunder, as well as switching um, tense. Switching tense uh -huh. also seems to be something that a new writer will do and may not catch it um, because both have their really slippery nuances. You know, you don't think that you're switching tense or you're switching point of view, but you really are. So mm -hmm. do you guys have anything else to say about point of view before we um, um, move on to our piece, our fun exercise that we typed up just before the podcast? I just anything wanted to else? say that um, I kind of looked up some information about how different points of view affect readers. And um, when... And I've discussed this study before where they they hooked writers up to, and, um, to a functional MRI and saw how their brain functioned while they were writing. Well, they've also done that with readers to see how a reader's brain reacts to what they're reading. And so under a functional MRI, if you are reading a book and in the book um, the character is riding a bicycle, the part of your brain that would light up if you were riding a bicycle lights up so it's almost as if you are riding a bicycle and, and which point of view is that it doesn't matter oh but it, it, that happens in all point of views but it's stronger in first person hmm. so for instance uh, that's why i brought up hunger games earlier um because they brought it up in this article i was reading that when you read the hunger games not so much when you watch the movie but when you read it and it's in first person and the part of your brain that the part of Katniss's brain that's lighting up when she is in danger in the arena and she has to run for her life or fight for her life, that same part of your brain is lighting up as if you I, were the one. And so you actually become as, as mentally become Katniss Everdeen. Let me interrupt really quick. Uh, Maria Johnson is, uh, is talking live on our YouTube uh, channel and she says that she thinks that Hunger Games is not only first person, but she thinks it's first person present tense. Is that true? I've not read it, and she felt and she felt like that that made it more it more unique. And wouldn't you say that would also affect you too? Like present tense really feels makes you feel right. like you're in the middle of it, right? So, yes, and so when you read that book, that's why the book was so much better than the movie. Uh, personal opinion, but this also the book is always better than the movie. Here's the you science. Need, you need to back because your brain is reacting to what you're reading and your brain thinks you are in that arena as Katniss Everdeen fighting for your life. Yes. And for anyone who may not know, present tense means instead of saying she picked up her bow, she, I pick up my bow and head out the door, right? Like, so that everything is happening right now. And I wonder if people who do not enjoy reading first person, I wonder if they also pick up their literature or their novel to escape. And so maybe it feels uncomfortable to be put into situations and maybe like subconsciously, that's why there's kind of a pushback against it because I'm not reading this book to go run around and be scared for my life. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'm reading this book to read about somebody else, you know, having adventures. So maybe that's, kind of at play there. Could be. All right, All before right. we move on, one more thing that Maria brought up that I think I don't think we talked about enough. Sorry, I have a piece of hair like right here and I can't find it. Um, she says, she makes a comment about how she um, she started her historical fiction in third person, but it didn't feel right. So she changed it to first person point of view and it flowed much better. Have you guys mm. ever done that before? Because that's actually a good tip. Like if you're writing something and you're struggling with it, maybe it, as you change the point of view. Sometimes I change when I'm writing and I'm writing a scene from one of the characters' point of view and it just isn't coming right. Sometimes I just try switching to the other character and it just makes it easier or better or just fits better. 
But what about your whole piece? Have you guys ever done that? Like change the point of view for the whole piece? Yes, but not, uh, you know, 40,000 words in. I have a piece that I, uh -huh. is a, it's a work in progress that's been languishing that I really want to get back to. And I started writing it first person because it's young adult. And I thought, well, first person should be wrote young adult. Well, it's like, why am I listening to just a rule? Because when I went back and wrote it in third person, it was much better because I realized then I could switch to a different character's point of view in, in future and it would be better for the piece. I like Tina's, to, um, I like to, to um, like with my current novel that I'm editing, I wrote Angelica's backstory in first person. Um, so it's not in the novel. The first person's not in the novel, but her backstory I wrote all in first person. And that just helped me to get into her head so that I was in her head. So when then when I went to write, I understood my character more. It helped me that way. Um, and um, But I most of the longer pieces, okay, there's only like three. <laughs> I shouldn't like say like there's dozens and dozens, but they're in third person limited. So... And did you but start did. out that way? Like, did you make a choice or did you just put your hands to the keyboard and that's how it came out? I made that choice because I like to write the story from different perspectives, from different characters' perspectives. Gotcha. So I want to be able to, like, next next chapter, different character. Kind of is stuff. Yeah. Is there ever a first person? So you title the next chapter Chris and it's first person from Chris's point of view. And then you title the next chapter Jennifer and it's first person from Jennifer's point of view. Like. I don't think I've ever seen that done. I have. I have Does it work? Like that. And I tend to get irritated. <laughs> because now I am Jennifer. Mm. You know, like it's first person. So you feel like you are Jennifer. Okay, now I have to stop being Jennifer and be Joe. If I could and only I stop being Jennifer. <laughs> Um, and, and so I found it irritating and I actually found myself skipping the Joe chapters and re only reading the chapters that were from the perspective of the character I started as that I wanted to be. Wow. Well, that's, yeah. So <laughs> Jennifer is the reason you don't want to be Jennifer is because you always have to go first when we read our um, 15 minute pieces. Um, I don't want to be Jennifer right now because Rhonda is actually... Um, <laughs> in our chat and, Yay! Um, and oh, so my. yeah she's actually in here so um, i don't think i'm really sorry rhonda yeah, <laughs> when, rhonda. when i read what i'm about to read i really i love you and i'm really sorry <laughs> okay so what we we every podcast we spend 15 minutes only 15 minutes although today we gave ourselves like five extra words so 15 minutes plus five extra words writing uh a little short piece based on a prompt and lately we've been doing like a word generator so we're like well that's kind of dull and so someone i'm not gonna say who because it was me said <laughs> that we should write a story about rhonda not being on the podcast today and of course everybody said no we shouldn't do no such thing wrong of course everybody said that sounds amazing and so our prompt today was Rhonda is missing. Isn't that right? Did I get it right? Yes. Something like that. Yeah. I would so, be where in the world is Rhonda Hagerman. <laughs> I would be willing to go first because there would be nowhere to go but up from there. All <laughs> right. <laughs> so um, I'm going to be listening and also trying to read if Rhonda comments. <laughs> all right. So go ahead, Tina. What did you write on the topic Rhonda's missing? Okay, you ready? Yeah. It was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck, said Rhonda Hagerman. I didn't drive all the way to Florida for this. She waved her arm in the direction of the beach where the ocean waves could be seen, crashing and foaming on the sand in the flashes of the lightning. Quit whining and hand me a hammer, said John, holding a panel of plywood against the window with one hand and reaching out for a hammer with the other. The wind blew his beard sideways and grabbed the sound of his voice and whisked it away as well. Rhonda handed him the hammer. I came here for sun and warmth, not this. I'd be better off in Michigan sitting in front of a warm fire. John hammered the plywood into place. That's it. Last one. Let's get out of here, he said. Rhonda sighed and followed him through the, their rented beach bungalow to the car. She climbed in the passenger seat and buckled up, looking worriedly at the palm trees bending almost 90 degrees in the wind. 
John turned the key and a clicking sound filled the front seat. <gasps> John looked at Rhonda looked at John in alarm. He tried again, more clicking. John rested his forehead against the steering wheel. It's dead, he said. Rhonda resisted the urge to call him Captain Obvious. <laughs> How did that happen? He asked instead. John opened his mouth to reply, but at that moment, one of the palm trees snapped and went flying in front of their car like a missile. They both removed their seatbelts and made a mad dash to the car, to the house. John fumbled with the keys, trying to find the right one. Rhonda turned to look back and saw the palm trees snapping one by one, one of them barely missing the car. Hurry, she cried, but the door was open and they tumbled inside. They ran to the bathroom, the only room without a window, and shut the door. John sat on the floor and Rhonda the toilet. Well, this is romantic, Rhonda said. John grumbled, John grumbled something under his breath. The light, the breath. The light flickered and went out. Three, two, one. Oh, yay. yay! Okay, I know this is fiction because Rhonda resists the urge to call John Captain. No, just kidding. <laughs> she would never resist the urge to call him anything. That's so true. Um, she did comment. Let's see. She said, first of all, she put two laughing faces and said his beard. And then she said, yeah, but I bet the shelling was great. <laughs> like getting the shells, like because of the storm. That's hilarious. Yeah. Aww. Well, I'm glad that she has a good, she's being a good sport um, yeah. about it. And I, so just that's great. I had no idea that it was the start of hurricane season. So. That's funny. Well, it really technically doesn't start until May, I guess. But like people are advocating for them to start talking about it earlier because storms come up and, you know, a lot of people want to hype up some of the just tropical weather and kind of try to call it a hurricane because it makes better news. So like there's a little bit of controversy. But anyway, whatever. It's We're going into the season. So good job, Tina. Great. I love how the wind carries away his voice also and the beard thing. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Even though he's shaved his beard down, I saw some pictures of their Florida trip just this Hi. morning. And I, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, he's no longer got the Duck Dynasty thing going on. It looked a lot shorter. <laughs> this ruined Unless my I, story. I'm sorry. She well, my it. story oh. has stuff in it that's not really true to life, I don't think. But I'll go next because then it'd be a nice breakup of my voice. Um, All right. You know, whatever. One, okay. Real quick, one last comment. She says, that was such a good story, Tina. And then three hearts. Aww. Aww. Glad you liked it. Okay, so topic, Rhonda's missing. Here we go. <clears throat> Turn off. Here? Yes. John squinted against. Okay, so first of all, I just want to say I experimented with third person omniscient, just so you know. Like, so if you oh. see head hopping, it's me trying to do omniscient. Okay. John squinted up at, John squinted against the sun up at the exit sign as it zipped over their car. Suck a tash. What of interest could possibly be found off an exit for a town called Succotash? There's a Confederate graveyard about 14 miles up the road, Rhonda said, turning to shove herself between the front seats and digging through the mound of luggage to find her grave rubbing supplies. You know, some of that groovy history you love so much? Ah, she said as she located the appropriate bag. She hoisted it to her lap and peered inside, marveling as usual at the beautiful washi tape mosaic cover she crafted for the album. <laughs> as she rummaged through the bag, she found a tube-shaped individual serving size package of cocoa roasted almonds. Jackpot, she said, holding them up triumphantly for John. Awesome, he said, snatching, him from, snatching them from her. I'm starving. Hey, that was my buried treasure, Rhonda whined, but the smile on her face was all the permission John needed to rip the top off the tube and pour three cocoa-covered delights into his mouth. I thought this was supposed to be your gourmet getaway, Rhonda said. You've been turning up your nose at my road trip snacks since we left Briny Breezes. John shook his head. With my stomach gnawing at me the way it is, I can't afford any snobbery. I'll take what I can get. I mean, what kind of gourmet experience do you think I'll be able to dig up in a town called Succotash? They rode the rest of the miles in silence, John relishing the texture, sweetness, and crunch of the almonds, Rhonda anticipating the delights that awaited her at the long-forgotten burial grounds. At last, they pulled into the site. There was a white steepled building, which Rhonda explained was a replica building of the building that stood on the prop property at the time of the cemetery's founding. It houses a museum now, she said, looking at her watch. It doesn't open until 10, though, so... Oh, no. 
What? John asked. I totally forgot. There was something I hoped to be doing at 10 o'clock on Thursday morning. <laughs> you mean something other than browsing the artifacts of the Succotash Heritage Museum? Rhonda frowned. John pulled out his phone. No service. Babe, you couldn't podcast from the road if you wanted to. And didn't you tell me the girls knew you were traveling today? Rhonda nodded. Still, it feels a bit like playing hooky to be frolicking through a Confederate cemetery during the podcast. You are so weird. That's why you love me. One of many reasons, but yeah. Come on now. Let's go explore us some groovy history. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm sad that I went last because I can't follow that. All right, <laughs> here are the live comments. Um, Rhonda says, "Snatching them, accurate, all caps." <laughs> Maria Johnson, author, says, "I love gourmet getaway." <laughs> and Rhonda says, "Suffering in Succotash" by J.R. Nichols. <laughs> Forgot about that. Yeah, that's great. And then she, she wants to know, Jamie, if you had a recorder in your car. <laughs> That's awesome. So that was really good. I enjoyed that. That was good. Awesome. All right. What did you come up with this prompt there, Jen? Again, Rhonda, I'm really sorry. <laughs> Actually, it didn't go as bad as I thought. Like, I thought it was going in a certain direction. Okay. So I also, like, tried to play around not with. And maybe it kind of was a point of view thing. Um, Jamie had done this before when she and I were writing together at the laundromat, actually, which was, Whoa, you know, interesting. Yeah. Where Ron, Jamie wrote an entire piece only in dialogue with nothing else. And so as I was writing this, I realized I'm only writing in dialogue. And I'm like, well, let's just see where this goes. And I, so I, I forced myself to only write in dialogue. So it might be easier to read than to listen to, though. So because you can't see the end. So I'll try to. Pause. Oh, so you're not going to have like a John voice and a Rhonda voice? You could be like, oh, this is oh. Rhonda's voice. Oh, this is John's voice or something. Oh, <laughs> no, because John and Rhonda aren't in it. Rhonda's missing. Oh, that's right. Okay. Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> Where in the world is Rhonda Hagerman? Oh, great. Now I have that song stuck in my head. Good, because it's been stuck in mind since the minute we realized Rhonda was lost. Rhonda isn't lost. Do you know where she is? No, but that doesn't mean she's lost. It doesn't mean that she isn't. It doesn't. Oh, sorry. She's probably just in the bathroom somewhere. For the last hour and a half? I don't know what her digestive system issues are. Who said she had digestive system issues? Anyone who spends an hour and a half in the bathroom has issues. We don't know that she's in the bathroom. Wait, unless you aren't telling me something. There's a lot I don't tell you, but none of it has to do with Rhonda. You aren't helping the situation. Who says there's a situation? You implied it, old creator of the digestive system theory. Can you imagine an hour and a half? I sure would feel sorry for whoever went in there after her. I'm sorry, Rhonda. I'm really sorry. Can we get serious? We haven't seen Rhonda for nearly two hours. What if something happened to her? Maybe we should split up and sweep the area looking for her. Oh, no, you're not leaving me alone in this hillbilly heaven. Might I remind you that I didn't want to come to this ridiculous place and I'm not about to get trapped into whatever redneck vortex Rhonda has been sucked into. <laughs> what are you talking about? There are no traps in Branson. It's one giant tourist trap. Scariest trap I've ever been in. This is getting us nowhere. Maybe we should check the hotel. She could have gone back there. Maybe we should check the local hospital or the police station. Do you think they have a morgue there? Maybe we should check there. Um, I'm no detective, but maybe we should check that little building over there. What building, Tina? Yeah, what? Yeah, Tina, what building? The one with the sign that says Historical Society? Three, two, Yay. one. I'm glad I was the voice of reason. So <laughs> did you? Yeah. <laughs> so the other two ridiculous voices are, I guess, me and Jamie. Like, I could hear our, our voices, though I'm not sure which one of us was being the ridiculous one. And then... As I'm writing, I'm like, Tina's got to show up here somewhere. So, yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> sorry about your digestive system issues, Rhonda. <laughs> I really like that. And now I Did think you? we should go to Branson. I've never been. Uh, I have. You don't like it? Literally. That must be I'm the one saying hillbilly heaven and redneck vortex. I went there <laughs> as a child, and it's probably a conversation 
for the postcast because I could go on and on, but it was horrible. Like, could not wait to get out of there. And everybody that says, oh, best vacation we ever took should have been on my vacation because it wasn't. So, so you were a kid. Do you think that that colored it? Because, like, my kids don't like to do anything that I think is fun because they just perceive it as, like, I don't know. Like, I guess grown-up fun isn't the same as little kid fun or you're not ever willing to give it another chance. I'm not willing to give it another chance. <laughs> It's out in the middle of nowhere. So if you're having a miserable time, there's nothing you can do. Like, it's just, yeah. It's like, and I guess it's gotten a lot bigger and there's more stuff. But every time somebody explains to me how great it is, it just sounds like a giant hillbilly redneck Vegas. And I don't like Vegas either. So it's just not my cup of tea. <laughs> Sorry for everybody who loves Branson. You go well, have fun. What if you love hillbillies and rednecks? I do love hillbillies. I my family is from the south, so I can I'm allowed to say that. I offended somebody once when I used the word redneck, and I felt bad for about a second. Then I was like, "Sorry, <laughs> I'm so mean." Well, um, so. today we are not having uh, the postcast because we really do not want to do that without Rhonda present. Um, it's one thing to to find our way through a podcast without her. Um, astute insights but we we really need her for the postcast so if you're our patreon sorry we'll be back next week with a postcast and if you are not our patreon subscriber again you should go over there and check it out because you have um 30 ish uh episodes for your binging pleasure if you want to see what we submit when we are doing writing group and how we critique one another Hopefully, it will help you to also become a better giver and receiver of critique. You also get some cool freebies when you sign up and uh, sign up for our email list so that you'll never miss an episode of the Christian Indie Writers Podcast. Uh, oh, we didn't go to the accountability corner yet. Um, so and did we get any responses on our in the chat over Jennifer's story? Um, Rhonda wants to know if the bathroom had a window directly to the beach. <laughs> So she could escape. Is that what That's why she would she be said, in there? Yeah, she said, or the or the cemetery. So I guess uh, she could spend an hour and a half in the bathroom if that if it either one. So, yeah. Awesome, and I love the level of snark in your piece. Oh, great creator of the digestive theory issue. Yes, that's very that, true to life. I have to say. I think in my mind, you were that person. You were the person that was like, and I was the one just being like completely ridiculous because I didn't want to be in Branson, Missouri. And why Why did I choose Branson, Missouri? I don't know. I don't know where that came from. Because I, you had I, 15 minutes. It's about right. the same place that Succotash came from. Just like. <laughs> Is Succotash a real place in Florida? Um, I was thinking that they were already up into like Tennessee or something by then. I don't know. Like my brain did not have them in Florida. Like they were out of there. So I just made it up. Okay, okay. Because I'm like, if there's really a place called Succotash, we have to go. <laughs> that would be awesome. All right. So accountability. Um, Tina, how are you doing with your goals? And what are your goals for next time? I'm doing pretty good. I, I'm getting my hours in that I set for my goal for Camp Nano. Um, I'm not really happy with how far into my novel I am with the editing. It's a little going a little slower than I thought. Um, but I'm going to stick with it because I'd rather go slower and do it right than push myself and do a sloppy job. Amazing. So for next time, you just want to sort of steady on then? Yep. All right. And Jen? you oh. want to hold me accountable for writing thank you notes. I, I write <laughs> yes, you had, uh, you had some uh, thank you notes to write. And so, okay, we'll check in with you to see if you've done that. How about that? Okay. And well, and if I can remember, I'll aggravate you during our office hours too. Oh. So that it's like not another whole week going by before someone asks you. All right. So, uh, Jen, how's the week gone for you? Well, the writing has been kind of slow. I have not updated. I've done more writing than what it looks like on Camp Nano on our, in our cabin. Um, I need to go back through and do all the math and figure it out. Um, but it has gone kind of slow. But I had a really, really productive day yesterday other than writing. Um, and I'm going to share screen really quick to show you guys how, what exact, can I share screen when we're doing live? Should be able to, right? There it is. Um, so, Whoa, it's us I, for infinity. Oh, look at that. I'm only showing that much because I want to be able to do a um, 
you know, obviously a cover reveal, but I worked on my cover yesterday and I'm very, very happy with it. So, um, yeah, so that was very exciting for me Yay. yesterday to get all that done because I'm, I'm not been, I've been kind of struggling with that. So like I'm moving forward in my career, I'm moving forward in publishing. Um, I just, I don't know why I'm struggling so much with this story. Like I, I think that possibly I just don't know the characters enough. I know the story, but I feel like I don't know the characters enough and I just don't know why that is such a problem for me right now. So I don't know, but so accountability moving forward, I need to get caught up on words, which will be difficult this weekend because my hubby is going to be home and it's Easter. And so, um, yeah, I feel like wow. I'm just the bad, the bad student right now that you guys just need to like, <clears throat> like I'm just so not on my way. Maybe your goal for next week shouldn't be to be caught up, but maybe your goal should be like, I'll write something every day, even if it's only 50 words, you know what I mean? So that your goal right. is a little more realistic because you do want to make sure that you're putting family first. Um, yes. right. So right, I don't that's know the reason I do that. this, that, right. That's the whole reason that I'm doing this. Cause I could go out and get a job. I mean, well, not the whole reason. Cause I really love to write, but, <laughs> um, my family has to come first, God first, then my family and then my career. And, um, so, you know, keep God first. And then this weekend is going to be all about family because, um, my husband's not home all the time. And so, so, so what do yeah. you think about an adjustment to your goal? Like to, instead of saying, I'll be caught up with my nano words, which sounds mm -hmm. like, oh my goodness, you're going to have to spend a lot of time. Cause you know, you're not gonna be able to devote big chunks of time, um, while you're having hubby time. And then there'll be even more that you have to do between Monday and Thursday. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So is, do you want to amend your goal or you still think you could do it? Um, how about if I just don't get any farther behind? Okay. And, um, I think lots of times it's really good for me from, um, to be able to discuss what my characters and stuff with my husband. So, um, if, what if I say for career wise, this is, this is what this time is about. If I don't get any farther behind this weekend, and that I put aside time for just my husband and I to spend time talking about this book and, and my career moving forward. Cause that usually, it's a really good time for us when we do that because he's on this journey with me too. And sometimes it helps us to reconnect because I feel like sometimes my career is so separate from my family because, you know, writing is a solitary, can be a very solitary thing. And so um, I think that will help me to meld, maybe connect with these characters more if I can get, you know, some feedback from him. How's that sound? That sounds great. And I think there's wisdom there. Um, I just like to throw in that I don't think there's good and bad students. I think there's just us moving forward toward our goals at whatever pace we happen to be doing at that time. Oh, that's a wonderful sentiment, Tina. I agree with that. Um, I have been getting my word count for Camp Nano. I'm feeling a little bit like Jennifer about it. And the tricky thing is, it's not that I don't like the story. It's not that I don't like the characters. I, I just feel like, I think I just don't like this kind of writing to a deadline because I feel like everything I write is garbage, which I understand that the whole thing of NaNoWriMo is you're supposed to throw out your editor and just get the words down on the paper. But I really feel like you must write a thousand words on this story today is too limiting for me and makes everything that I do come out just so stilted. Because mm -hmm. instead of spending my thousand words on something that excites me or makes me want to write, you know, um, I have to be working on this piece. And I, I think I just don't like it, but I'm doing it. I'm muscling through. And again, at the end of the month, I'll have 30,000 words that I can do whatever I want with. The problem I have is I have like 10 of that already. And I really do not like that I'm adding to my future workload another big project to edit. So I'm, I'm a little bit struggling, but I'm still... I'm still going to get the words out. I'm still going to, you know, keep moving forward with the daily word count goal. Um, although it has been really tempting to change my nano goal to like 20,000 so that I could just be done. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and then I also <clears throat> have been watching a Udemy course on how to use GIMP because I would like to be able to design covers that um, I feel are better than what I'm able to produce right now. And that's really going very well. So that's the other way that I'm moving my writing career forward. As far as like, what will I publish? What am I going to do? Um, I've been really not wanting 
to go and edit up my shorts that I could be submitting. And so I have a little bit of an adjustment of attitude that has to happen there. So I would like for my accountability by next Thursday to have two pieces in my backlog ready to submit. So that's my um, commitment as well as continuing to work on my Camp Nano goal. Awesome. Have you thought about changing your goal instead of a word count to a time? That I'm going to spend this much time writing. And then maybe no, I hadn't considered that. That's something to think about. To get that you know? many words out and you can focus on quality over quantity. Hmm. And maybe that'll feel better to you if you did that. Well, Ever I will think about that and I'll check in next week and let you know what I decided. Although those of you who are in my cabin will know. <laughs> You know, I, it's a great conversation to have because I we all have different personality types. Like Jamie mentioned that like it's still to her to have like this like number goal or like this kind of like constraint on her. And to me, generally, that kickstarts me like, oh, I got to reach that goal. And then once I get going, I it, I don't, you know, stop generally. Um, this, I just am trying to figure out what's wrong with me this month. But usually it's not. So I think it's a good conversation because I think people watching this, there'll be different personalities that will have different experiences. And so um, it would be before, interesting to hear what our listeners, like what kind of goals they have set for themselves. Yeah. Yep. So comment below or on the side, we have some more comments that I want to real quickly go over before we log off of here. You can either comment here or tweet us. Um, we respond to our tweets pretty quickly. Uh, try to at least. Uh, Rhonda, shared her goal. She says, Camp Nano, thanks to this trip, I've almost completed my goal for the month. Woo! Yay! She said she'll update today, meaning uh, in our cabin, she'll update. Uh, Barb Beast uh, says to you, Jamie, instead of GIMP, try Kiera. It's a free open source. K-E-I-R-A. Interesting. Um, and yeah, so thanks, everybody. I just want to share that. All right. Well, <clears throat> if there's nothing else to add, we'll go ahead and sign off. Uh, that concludes this episode of the Christian Indie Writers Podcast. So until next time, may your pen be prolific, may your deadlines be met, and may all of your words honor Christ. Have a great day. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone.